Do you know? Just over there, there's a road sign. It says Church View. That's the name of these cottages here, these little houses. And I found from experience that if you actually stand by that sign, you can get a wonderful view and a picture right? of the church. Oh, OK, yeah. OK. And oh. it always makes me laugh. You know, visitors say, is that thoughtful of them? Put this sign up, Church View, <laughs> so you know where to take a picture. It's the name of the houses. Now, gravestones, we didn't have gravestones in Brewster's time. If you were rich, you would have been buried inside the church and have oh. a memorial. Markers would have been wooden, but we tend to get gravestones from the 1700s onwards. Late 1600s, 1700s. There is actually one just down there dating to 1776. And I always find that amusing that there's a gravestone here as old as America. Right now, hope this is done. Not what I might have to wait. No, they've done it for us. <laughs> is that the name of the church? St. Wilfrid's, yes. Now, you see here, uh -huh. do you know what these little benches are for? This is where the first grammar schools were to be held in oh. church porches. So this is the origin of a grammar school where you would have you know, youth come and of course the vicar would have learnt Latin, he's more probably or not a university man and so a part of his duties would be to school, you know, children but only, you know, noble or richer children. The, the peasant children never got a chance, they didn't get schooling. Yeah. Right, shall we come in? Well, this one before. Yeah, but it's very plain. Can you see how plain it is? It's quite plain church. Oh, you repair. Yes, it's a lot of money. These churches are very old, so they take a lot of repair. Especially if you've only got, say, 20 people in a congregation. It is difficult. In America, they've got one of these benches in the museum. This bench here was here in Brewster's time. Oh, yes. So these are the benches that were here in William Brewster's time. There's one, I think it's in Pilgrim Hall Museum, mm -hmm. and it's in a glass case. But here, you know, you can actually touch it and see it. Hmm. That must be heavy too. That's all right. And it would have matched the... At one point, they would have had rude screens. And the grapes and that are, are very sort of common in English churches. You know, the vine, the fruitfulness. Yeah, very common to have eagles in English churches, especially from sort of the Victorian era. You know, it's, it's, it's like the word of God soaring upwards. What is uh, in the book of Isaiah? Mm. Chapter 1, I can't remember. So they became very popular, sort of in the Victorian era. There's this big revival and you have these mm. eagles. You get me, most churches. But I like them. And they work, don't they? Mm -hmm. The arms yeah. in a practical level. Right, so this is the church that William Brewster would have attended. Now, there is a plaque at the end of the church left by the Mayflower Society saying that William Brewster was baptised in this church. Mm. We don't know that because the records don't exist. But he probably was. Certainly brought up in this village because just across the way there is Scrooby Manor. Scrooby Manor was a palace of the Archbishop of York. The Archbishop of York had an enormous sea. A sea is the area that he had control of. It was absolutely enormous. And he had all of these palaces where he would travel the circuit of his area, stay at one palace for a couple of weeks, 
move on from here. He probably went to Saddle one direction, which is mm. not on Sheer Wing, not on Sheer, but so, Saddle or, or Bishop Thorpe, mm. one of his palaces near York. But here he was the Lord of the Manor. Uh -huh. So he's the, he the second person from the Archbishop of Canterbury, right? Yes, yes. It's the hierarchy is Archbishop of Canterbury yeah. and then Archbishop of York, and then all the other bishops are, are down below. But yes, yeah. he's second in, dead right, second in command. So very, very important. And most of the Archbishops of York were very rich, you know, very powerful. This is what I find difficult to equate, is bishops at that time being so rich and many of them, mm. not very godly at all. It's a position mm -hmm. of power, and you yeah. think yeah. it's so wrong. Now, you Look know, at Wolsey, uh -huh. what a nasty man he was. Uh -huh. You know, he, he, he collected titles. Uh -huh. He was Archbishop of York and didn't come here to the end of his life, uh -huh. but the amount of money he had was incredible. And yet, ordinary parishioners were starving each winter. Uh -huh. It's just so inequitable. You know, at, uh, I, I didn't sit down at that time. I, I used to go to, to visit the Catholic Church in Thailand, and they have, they have the Archbishop and Bishop, and, and they know how. I know how important when I was in Thailand. But when I came to America, I, I didn't quite understand yet uh, what the importance of the, the Bishop and Archbishop. Mm -hmm. But last year we went to Germany and at Worms, and they said that they call the Prince Bishop. He is a he he. He's the leader of, of the church, and at the same time, he like like the king of yeah, that area. Yeah, so, yeah. And, they, they have, and, that, yeah. and that's it was really powerful when you're yeah. at the Tudor era. Uh -huh. Bishops were enormously uh -huh. powerful men. Yeah. Contrast to our Bishop of Lincoln, who retired a couple of years ago, and they asked the bishop, "What would he like as a retiring present?" You know, back in the olden days, probably be you know gold crown, something like that. You know. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, I could quite use a new kitchen table, <laughs> you know, and that was nice. Yeah. And the Archbishop of York, now our Archbishop there, he, he, he's often, he, he's known, if the radio people are in, the, in there wanting to interview him, he'd be cooking their breakfast. Yeah. You know, he's very down-to-earth man. Yeah. Right. Do you want to sit down for a bit and I'll tell you about yeah. William Brewster? It might be more comfortable on your legs. Okay. Otherwise, your legs are going to be so sore by yeah. the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell you how William Brewster fits into this story. I don't know how much you know about I don't know him. anything here. William Brewster anything. is one of the leading Pilgrim Fathers. In fact, he's the one that you can trace from the very beginning of the separatist movement here who actually makes it to the New World. He's in at the beginning, he's there at the end. And he is a very important man because, yes, the spiritual leader is extremely important. But Brewster was a very practical man. He was the doer. He was like the conscience. He was the man who could motivate. He was the man who could open doors and get things done. So like the backbone of the movement. So without him, this whole story could have just not happened. And as I said, when we were at Babworth, Richard Clifton was here in 1586. William Brewster wasn't. William Brewster was away from Scrooby, and if things had worked out for him, he wouldn't have returned because he was in the diplomatic corps. He was working for a very high-ranking diplomat Matt, called William Davidson. Have you heard of him? William Davidson. He would have been one of those people who may have been sent up and down this great north road to Scotland to negotiate with the Scots at the end of Elizabeth's reign. Oh. But he was also, he also served in Holland. Now, we don't know how he met young Brewster. Brewster was at university. He didn't take a degree. He went to university. I think Brewster was about 13. That was quite common, mm -hmm. 13. He meets up with Davidson. So he's still a teenager. And probably, 
I expect they met at, across the road at Scrooby Manor because if Davison was going up and down the Great North Road, he would have to stop and rest and eat and be looked after. And as that was one of the posts, he may have met young Brewster there. Whatever, Brewster becomes his protege. And Davison takes him under his wing. And they end up in Holland and they actually spend time in Leiden. Oh. So Brewster not only gets to know Leiden, he gets to know the city fathers there yeah. and he gets some of the language. He must have picked up some of the language while he was there as well. After serving in Holland with Davidson, Davidson comes back to the court in London. So Brewster would have known intimately all the workings of Queen Elizabeth's court and probably knew some of the leading figures there. It's, they may have actually known him. People like Sir Francis Walsingham, Chief Spymaster, they would have known Brewster because he was a protégé of Davidson. So Brewster was actually set to be a diplomat and to probably stay in London and have a high-flying career of his own. And would have done had not Davidson fallen from grace because Elizabeth had in prison Mary Queen of Scots. She had been the centre of so many plots against Elizabeth that her Privy Council wanted Elizabeth to have Mary executed. And Elizabeth really didn't want to do that because if she had her cousin executed, it opened you know, the floodgates, a can of worms. She would be setting a precedent for, say, the King of Spain to come over if he could catch Elizabeth, have her executed. Because if a queen can execute a queen, then a king can execute a queen. Mm. It was dangerous ground. Elizabeth actually called Davison to her. It said that she put it to him. There is this problem, this problem with Mary. Wouldn't it be a shame if she had an accident? Perhaps she, you know, accidentally fell down the stairs, you know, or accidentally got poisoned, or the suggestion was there to do away with her quietly, and Davidson, being a godly Puritan man, would not have any part of that. In the end, the Privy Council prepared a death warrant, and Davidson was sent to give it to Elizabeth to sign. Now, Elizabeth knowing the dangers of this, we really didn't want to sign this. But in the end, is persuaded to, but on one condition, she makes sure Davison knows that that death warrant, although it's signed, it's not to be carried out until she gives her express command. What happens? Davison takes the death warrant back to the Privy Council and they immediately have Mary executed. And Elizabeth is absolutely furious. I mean, if you think Henry VIII was volatile, Elizabeth was just her father in a dress. She was terribly volatile. In fact, she wanted Davidson hung as soon as she found out. You can imagine the rest of the Privy Council. They know he hasn't done anything wrong. He only took the document to be signed. But on the other hand, none of them are going to say, Your Majesty, this is outrageous, in case they end up being punished as well. So Davison ends up in the Tower of London. Now in the Tudor times, if you had a master and they fell from grace, the first thing you would do would be, you'd be off to find another master. You would get as far away from your master who's fallen from grace. This shows what a man Brewster was, what sort of caliber of a, a man he was because he stayed with his master. And in the Tower of London, in any prison in England, you had to have your food brought to you, you had to pay for everything. So whatever Davison needed, Brewster acted as his eyes, his ears, and his go-to person. He would even bring his food in for him. Meanwhile, Brewster's father up here, running the post and bailiff of the Archbishop's lands here at Scrooby, was becoming ill. And as Davison is eventually released in 1588, 
you can imagine the conversation. Brewster knows by now that his father's really ill. Reluctant to leave his master, but the master knowing that he has been served well by this young man and his duty now lies with his father. So he returns here and for the last 18 months of his father's life, he's in charge of the post and the position of bailiff. I don't know, you have the word bailiff in America? Uh, like so he does something for a court. Mm -hmm. It's not a bond. very high position. A bond or something like that? Yeah, like, like a bondsman, bailiff. Oh. But here, a bailiff was a very important position. Oh, really? Oh. It was, you were the archbishop's deputy. When oh. the archbishop was away, oh. you stood in his place. You know, you collected all the rents. You sorted out local disputes. You saw to the court, which would be held locally over in the manor. Oh. So it was a high position, oh. a gentlemanly position. Oh. So, you know, it's not, not a menial job being a bailiff. Oh. In the Tudor era, you would, we would call it bribery, but back then it was common practice to offer money for a position. You had a nephew who wasn't going to inherit anything mm. and he was a bit useless. You went to, say, one of the government officials and say, oh, look, here's a thousand pounds, will you give him a position doing so-and-so for life? Somebody asked for the position of postmaster here. And so young Brewster realised that when his father died, the position of post was actually promised to someone else. If it had have been, he wouldn't have been here. So, if Davidson hadn't fallen from grace, Brewster wouldn't have been here. Brewster only, by the skin of his teeth, managed to hold on to the post after his father died, and that was only because Davidson put in a good word for him, or Brewster wouldn't have been here. And if he hadn't been here, this whole enterprise may not have taken off. But he does come here, he hears Clifton, he's like-minded, and you have a congregation growing. You have like-minded folk here listening to Clifton, but also for a very short time, at the very end of Elizabeth's reign, from about 1602, you have got a congregation of separatists down at Gainsborough as well. And the congregation of people in this area are a part of that congregation as well. Gainsborough is 12 miles away. In the summer when it's light, you can walk 12 miles in daylight. Mm. In the winter here, it gets dark. It's a bit, no, it's not like Alaska, but it gets dark about half four in the afternoon and it won't get light again to about seven, half seven, eight o'clock in the mm -hmm. morning. You can't travel those distances in the dark. In the summer, of course, it's so much lighter. So the Scrooby congregation were once a part of the congregation at Gainsborough and then split up because of logistics and met in secret just across mm. at the manor house. Again, if William Brewster hadn't been here, there would have been no congregation at Scrooby. Mm. So it's all mm. chance, isn't it? All of these elements are coming together. You know, you have Clinton, <coughs> Brewster, all just by chance coming together. It's like the perfect storm, isn't it? Mm. Gearing up. Right, would you like to go and see the remains of the manor in a minute? Okay. But we could have a little look round board.